From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. We're in our Palo Alto studios today for a Cube Conversation. Uh, we're talking about data, we're always talking about data, and it's really interesting, you know, we like to go out and get you the first person insight from the people that start the companies, run the companies, the practitioners, and, and, and get the insight directly from them. We also like to go out and get original research and hear from original research, and this is a great uh, opportunity to hear from both. So we're excited to have, and welcome back into the studio, he's Aaron Kolb, he's the co-founder of Alation, many time CUBE alumni. Aaron, great to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's very cool. But today it's a special uh, special thing. We've never done this before with you. You guys are releasing a brand new report called the Alation State of Data Culture Report. So really interesting report. A lot of great information that we're going to dig in here for the next uh, few minutes. But before we do, tell us kind of the history of this report. This is the, the kind of the inaugural release. What was kind of behind it? Why did you guys do this? And um, give us a little background before we get into the details. Absolutely. So yes, that's exactly right. It, it, it's debuting today that we plan to kind of update this research quarterly and kind of see the trends over time. Um, and th this emerged because, uh, you know, I, I, part of my job, I talk to chief data officers and chief analytics officers uh, across our customer base and prospects. And I kept hearing anecdotally over and over that establishing a data culture is, the, is often the number one priority for these data leaders and for these organizations. And so we wanted to really say, can we quantify that? Can we agree upon a definition of data culture? And can we create sort of a simple yardstick to more objectively measure where organizations are on this sort of data maturity curve to get a data culture? Right, I love it. So you created this data, uh, gover data index, right? The data culture index. And, uh, and I think it's important to look at methodologies. I think people a lot of times go right to the results on reports before talking about the methodologies. And let's talk about the methodologies because we're supposed to be talking about data, right? So you talked to 300 some odd executives, correct? And I think it's really interesting and you broke it down into three kind of buckets of data literacy, if you will. Um, data search and discovery, um, number one, data to kind of literacy in terms of their ability to work with the data. And then the third bucket is really data governance. Um, and then in, in, in good form, ABCD, you gave them a four point score and basically are they doing it well? Are they doing it the majority of the time? Are they doing it about half? They got one or they got a zero and you get this four point scale and you end up with a 12 point scale, which we're all familiar with from, uh, from school, from an A to an A minus and B, et cetera. Just dig in a little bit on those three categories and how, and how you chose those. So the first one again is kind of, um, their data search and discovery, you know, can they find it? And then their competency, if you will, and then a governance um, and compliance. Kind of dig into each of those three buckets a little bit. For sure. So, so the, the end goal in data culture is to have an organization in which data is valued and decisions are made based on data and evidence, right? Versus a culture in which we go with the highest paid person's opinion or what we did last quarter or any of these other ways uh, uh, things get done. And so the idea is to make that possible. As you said, you have to be able to find the data when you need it. That's the data search and discovery. You have to be able to interpret that data correctly and draw valid conclusions from it. And that's uh, data, data literacy, excuse me. And, um, and both of those um, are contingent upon having data governance in place so that um, data is well-defined and has high data quality and all these other aspects so that it's possible to find it and understand it properly. Right. And one of the things too that I think is really important that we called out, and again, we're going to dive into the, the details, is your perceived uh, execution versus the reported execution by the people that are actually providing data. And I think you found, and you've highlighted on specific slides that you know, there's not necessarily a match there. And sometimes that, you know, what you perceive is happening isn't necessarily what's happening when you go down and query the people in the field. So really important to come up with a number. And I think, uh, I think you said this is going to be an ongoing thing over a period of time. So you kind of start to see longitudinal changes in these organizations. Absolutely. And we're very excited to see those, those trends over time. But even at the outset, uh, this, this you know, very striking effect emerges, which is, as you said, if we ask one of these you know, 300 uh, da data leaders um, um, uh, you know, all, all around the world, actually, you know, if we ask um, 
how is the data culture at your company overall in this very broad, general, top-down way, and have them grade it on the sort of A to F uh, scale. Um, you know, we get results uh, where there's a large gap between kind of that uh, level of maturity and what emerges in a bottom-up methodology, excuse me, in which you uh, ask about, you know, governance and literacy and, 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 and search um, kind of by department and in a more bottom up way. And so we, we do see that, that uh, you know, it can be helpful even for data people to have a, a, a more granular metric and framework for quantifying their progress. Right, so let's jump into some of the results. It's, it's uh, fascinating. They're kind of all over the map, um, but there's some definite trends. One of the trends you talked about is that um, there's a lot of questions on the quality of the data. But that's a real inhibitor to people, whether that um, suspicion is because it's not, it's not good data. And I don't know, this is a question for you, is, is do they think it's not relevant to the decision that's being made? Is it an incomplete data set or the wrong data set? There seems to be, that keeps coming up over and over about decision makers not necessarily having confidence in the data. What, what can you share uh, a little bit more color around that? Yeah, it's quite interesting actually. So what we find is that 90%, so nine in 10 people, uh, 10 executives are thought to question the data, uh, sometimes, often, or always. Um, but the part that's maybe disappointing or concerning is that two thirds of executives are believed to ignore the data and, and make a decision kind of pushing the data aside, um, which is really quite uh, uh, striking when you think about it, why have all this data, if more often than not, you're sort of disregarding it to make your uh, uh, final uh, answer. And so um, you're absolutely correct that when we dug into why, what are the reasons behind um, pushing data aside, data quality was number one. Um, and I think it is a question of, oh, is the data inaccurate? Is it out of date? These are sort of concerns sort of we, we, we hear from customers and prospects. Um, but as we dig in deeper in the survey uh, um, uh, results, excuse me, we, um, we, we see some other reasons behind that. One is a lack of collaboration um, between the data and analytics folks and the business folks. And so there's a question of, I don't know exactly where this data came from, or to your point, kind of how it was produced, what was the methodology, how was it sourced? And maybe because of that disconnect, there's a lack of trust. So trust really is the ultimate, I think, barrier to having the data culture really take root. Right, and it's trust, and it's trust, as you said, not only in the data per se, uh, the source of the data, the quality of the data, the relevance of the data, but also the people who are providing you with the data. And obviously, you get you get some uh, data sets. Sometimes you didn't get other data sets. So that's a re that's really um, a little bit disconcerting. The other thing I thought was kind of interesting is is it seems to be consistent that the the primary reason that people are using big data projects is around operations and operation efficiency. Uh, a little bit about compliance. But you know, it's interesting, we had you on at the MIT CDOIQ, Chief Data Information Officer Quality Symposium, and you talked about the goodness of people moving from kind of a defensive posture to an offensive posture, you know, using data in terms of product development and innovation. And, and what comes across in this survey is that's kind of down the list behind, you know, kind of operational efficiency. We're seeing a little bit of governance um, and regulation but the, the quest for data as a tool for innovation didn't really uh, shine through in this report. Well, you know, it's very interesting. It depends whether you look at the aggregate level or you um, break things down a little bit more. So one thing we did after we got that zero to 12 scale on the data culture index or DCI is it actually, we were able to break it down into thirds. And among the sort of bottom third that has the least well-established data culture um, by this yardstick, we found that governance and re regulatory compliance was the number one application of data. But among the top third of um, re re respondents, we actually found the opposite, where things like providing a great customer experience, doing product innovation, those sort of things actually came to the fore and governance fell behind. So I think there is this curve where it's table stakes to get the sort of defense side of data figured out, and then you can move on to offense and using data to make your organization meet its meet its other goals. Right, right. And then I wondered too, to get your take on kind of the democratization of data, right? This is a, this is a trend that's been going on and really, I, I think you said before, you know, your guys hold 
uh, mission is to empower curious and rational world, to give people the ability to ask the right questions, have the right data, uh, and get the right answer. So, you know, we've seen democratization in terms of the access to the data, the access to the tools, the ability to do something with the data and the tool, and then the actual authority to execute a business decision based on that. The, the results on that seem a little bit split here because uh, a lot of the problems seem to be focused on leadership, not necessarily taking a database decision um, uh, move. But on the good hand, a lot of people trying to break down data silos and make data more accessible for a larger group of people so that more people in the organization are making database decisions. This seems kind of like this little bit of a bifurcation between the C-suite and, uh, and everybody else trying to get their job done. Absolutely. There's always this question of, you know, sort of the, the, the organizational wide initiative and then what's happening on the ground. One thing we saw that was very heartening and aligns with where our customers have had success is um, a real emphasis being placed on having data governance and data context and data literacy um, uh, uh, um, factors sort of be embedded at the point of use. So not expecting people to just like take a course and look things up and kind of interrupt their workflow to be able to use data um, uh, quickly and accurately and, and interpret it uh, in valid ways. So that was really exciting to see as 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 an initiative that sort of bridges that gap along with initiatives to have more collaboration uh, and integration between the data people and the business people because really you know they they, they exist to, to serve one another. But in terms of the disconnect between the C-suite and other parts of the org. Um, there was a really interesting inverse correlation. Um, well, it, or maybe it's not inverse depending on how you look at it, but basically, um, you know, when we talk to C-level executives and ask, you know, does the C-suite ignore data? Do they question data, et cetera? Those numbers came in lower than when we talk to a, you know, senior director about the C-suite, right? So sort of the farther you get, um, you know, there's a difference there. Um, you know, from my perspective, I almost wonder whether um, that distance is actually just more objective viewpoint. And when you're in that role, it's hard to even see your cognitive biases and your tendency to ignore data when it doesn't suit you. Right, right. So there's there's some other interesting things here. So one of them is, you know, kind of predictors, right? One of the whole reasons you do studies and collect data so that we can have some predictive ability. And and it, it comes out here that the reporting structure is a strong predictor of a company's data tier structure. So, you know, there's the whole rise of the chief data officers and the chief analytics officer and the chief data and analytics officer and lots of conversations about those roles and what exactly are those roles and who do they report to. Your study finds a pretty compelling um, leading indicator that if that role is reporting to either the CEO or the executive board, which is often uh, one and the same person, that that's actually a, a terrific indicator of success in moving to a more data-centric culture. That's absolutely correct. So we found that that top third of uh, organizations on the uh, data culture index we're much more likely to have a you know, chief data executive, a CDO, CA, CAO, or CDAO. Um, in fact, they're more likely to have uh, folks with the analytics in their title, because in some organizations, uh, data is thought to mean sort of raw data, infrastructural defense, and analytics is sort of where it gets um, you know, uh, uh, infused into business processes and, and value. Um, but certainly, that top third is much more likely to have that the chief data executive um, um, uh, re re reporting into the uh, executive board or CEO when the uh, highest ranking data executive is under the CIO or some other part of the organization, those orgs tend to score uh, far lower on the DCI. Right, right. So it's interesting, you, you know, you're a really interesting guy. You've been doing this for a while and you were at Siri before you were at Alation. So you have a really good feel for kind of what data can do and can't do. And, Natural human uh, or natural language processing and 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 human voice interaction with these uh, devices a really interesting case study and they can do a really good job within a small defined data set and instruction set but they don't do necessarily so well once you kind of get outside how how they're trained um, and you've talked a lot about how metaphors shape the way that we think and I know you and Dave talked about data oil and data lakes, and I don't want to necessarily go down that whole path, but I do think it's important in, in what came out of the study and the way people think about data. Um, you know, there's a lot of conversation. How do you value data? Uh, is data, you know, it used to just be an expense that we had to buy servers to store the stuff. We weren't sure what we ever did with it. So I wonder if there's any, you know, kind of top level, metaphorish level kind of uh, 
thought or process or framing uh, in the companies that you studied that came out maybe not necessarily in the top line data but maybe in some of, of the notes that helped define why some people ha uh, you know, are being successful at making this transition and putting you know kind of data out front of their decision processing versus data either behind as a supporting thing or maybe data I just don't have time with it or I don't trust it or God knows where you got that and it's not the data that I wanted. You know, was there any you know, kind of tangential or anecdotal stuff that came out of the study that's more reflective of, of the softer parts of a data culture versus the harder parts in terms of titles and roles and, and, and job responsibilities? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting uh, place to explore. Um, I do think there's a, a, I don't want to make this overly simplistic or binary, but at the end of the day, you know, like anything else within an organization, you can view data as a liability to say, okay, we have, for example, you know, customers' names and phone numbers and passwords, and we just need to prevent an adverse event in which there's a leak or, or some sort of infosec problem that could cause, you know, bad press and fines and, and other negative consequences. And I think the issue there is if data is a liability, um, the the most you know the the, the the best case is that it's worth zero as opposed to some huge negative uh, on your company's balance sheet, and um, and I think you know intuitively um, if you really want to prevent data misuse and data problems, uh, one fail safe, um, but I think ultimately. Uh, 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 in this own way, a risky way to do that was just to not collect any data, right? And not store it. Um, so I think that the transition is to say, look, data um, must be protected and taken care of. That's, you know, step zero. But, um, you know, it's really uh, just the beginning and data is this asset that can be used to inform um, the huge uh, 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 company level strategic decisions that are made in annual planning at the board level down to the millions of little decisions every day in the work of people in customer support and in sales and in product management and, and you know, various roles just across industries. And I think once you um, have that, that shift, you know, the upside is potentially, you know, unbounded. Right. And, um, and it just changes the way, the way you think. And suddenly, instead of saying, oh, data needs to be kind of hidden away, it's more like, oh, people need to be trained on data use and empowered with data. And it's all about not if it's used and if it's misused, but really how it's used and, and, and why it's used, what it's being used for to make a real impact. Right, and it's funny, what, I, I just remember being back in business school, one of the, the great things it helps teach you is to think in terms of data, right? And you always have the infamous uh, Accenture consulting interview question, how many manhole covers are there in Manhattan? Um, right, so you know, to, 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 to start to think about that problem from a data centric point of view really gives you a leg up and, and even you know where to start and how to attack those types of problems. And I thought it was interesting, you know, talking about challenges uh, for people to have a more data centric point of view. It's interesting, uh, the report said, basically everybody said there's all kinds of challenges around data quality and compliance and data democratization, but the bottom companies, the bottom companies said that the biggest challenge was lack of buy-in from company leadership. So I guess the good news, bad news is, is that there's a real opportunity to make a significant change and get your company from the bottom third to a middle third or a top third, simply by taking a change in attitude about putting data in a much more central role in your decision-making process. Because all the other stuff's kind of operational execution challenges, right, that we all have, not enough people, blah, blah, blah. But in terms of attitude of leadership and prioritization, that's something that's very easy to change if you so choose, uh, and really seems to, to be the key to unlock this real journey, as opposed to the minutia of a lot of the little details that, that are a challenge for everybody. Absolutely, and you know, changing attitudes might be the easiest thing or the hardest thing, depending right. on who the individuals are involved and what the culture is. But I think you're absolutely right. The first step, which 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 could and maybe should be easy, is admitting that you have a problem, or maybe to put it more positively, realizing you have an opportunity. I love that. Um, and then just again, looking at the top tier companies, um, 
The other thing that I thought was pretty interesting in the, in the study is I'm, I'm looking at it here, is getting champions in each of the operational segments. So rather than, I mean, a chief data officer is important and you know somebody kind of at the high level to shepherd it in the executive suite as we just discussed, but within each of the individual tasks and functions and roles, whether that's operations or customer service or product development or operational efficiency, you need some type of champion, some type of person you know, banging the gavel, collecting the data, smoothing out the, the complexities, helping people get their thing together. And again, another way to really elevate your position on the score. Absolutely, and I think this idea of, again, bridging between, you know, if data is centralized, you have a chance to try to really get excellent practices um, within the data org, but then it becomes even more essential to have those ambassadors, people who are in the business and understand all the business context, who can sort of make the data relevant, identify the key areas where data can really help, maybe demystify data, um, and you know, pick the right metaphors and the right uh, uh, examples to make it real for the people in their function. Right, right. So Aaron, there's a lot of great stuff. People can go to the website at elation.com. I'm sure you'll have a link to this uh, very prominently displayed and they should, and they should check it out and, and really think about it and think about how it applies to their own situation, their own department, company, et cetera. I just wanted to give you the last word before we, before we sign off, you know, kind of what was the most, you know, kind of positive affirmation or not the most, but some, one or two of the most out, kind of affirming um, outcomes of this uh, exercise. And what were one or two of the things that were a little concerning or, you know, uh, kind of surprises on the downside that, that came out of this research? Yeah, so I think one thing that was maybe surprising or concerning, the biggest one, is sort of where we started with that disconnect between, um, you know, what people would would say as an off-the-cuff overall assessment and the disconnect between that and what emerges when we go department by department and across those three pillars of data culture from uh, uh, search and discovery to data literacy to data governance. I think that disconnect, you know, should give one pause. I think certainly it should make one think, hmm, Maybe I shouldn't um, uh, look from 10,000 feet, um, but actually be a little more systematic and considering the framework I use to assess data culture, if that is the most important thing to my organization. I think though, um, there's this quote that you move what you measure, just having this uh, hopefully simple but not simplistic yardstick to measure data culture and the data culture index um, should help people be a little bit more realistic in that quantification and to track their progress, you know, quarter over quarter. So I think that's very promising. Um, I think another thing is that, you know, sometimes we ask how long have you had this initiative, how much progress have you made, and it can sometimes seem like pushing a boulder uphill. Um, obviously, the COVID pandemic and the economic impacts of that has been really tragic and really hard. You know, a, a, a tiny silver lining in that is uh, the survey results showed that organizations um, have really observed a shift in how much they're using data. Because sometimes things are changing, but it's like a frog in boiling water, you don't realize it. And so you just assume that the future is going to look like the recent past, and you don't look at the data, or you ignore the data, or you miss parts of the data. And a lot of organizations said, you know, COVID was this really troubling wake-up call, but that could, even after this crisis is over, produce an enduring change in which people are consulting data more and making decisions in a more data-driven way. Yeah, certainly an accelerant. That That is uh, for sure, whether you wanted it, didn't want it, thought you had it at the time, didn't have time. You know, COVID is definitely the digital transformation accelerant and data is certainly uh, the thing that powers that. Well, again, it's the Alation State of Data Culture Report available. Go check it out, alation.com. Uh, Aaron, always great to catch up. And uh, again, thank you for, for doing the work and supporting this research. And I think it's really important stuff and it's going to be interesting to see how it changes over time, because that's really when these, these types of, of re, uh, reports really start to add value. Thanks for having me, Jeff, and I really look forward to, to discussing some of those trends as the research is completed. All right, thanks a lot, Aaron, take care. Take All care. right, Bye -bye. he's Aaron, I'm Jeff. You're watching theCUBE, Palo Alto. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.